This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. What a good day to be in God's house. We're so glad that you're here. It's a special day for our church, a special day for Nikki, and we're glad that friends and family have gathered here along with her church family, and this is going to be a wonderful time of worship. Uh, I hope already that you have uh, found one of the handprints, and a number of them have already been filled out. Uh, after we're finished with this, we're going we're gonna to glue them to Nikki, and <laughs> th- this will be an opportunity for you to express a word of prayer, a blessing, a favorite scripture, uh, whatever you choose. This is a way for us to encourage and affirm her, uh, and I hope that uh, if you haven't done it already, that you will. We will be doing uh, our service a little differently, particularly when it comes to the laying on of hands, because of the concerns we have for safety and health. We're going to do that a little bit different, and I'll explain that a little, a little more in the uh, service. Yesterday morning, we gathered by Zoom uh, for the ordination council, and we had a wonderful time of uh, talking together and uh, interrogating Nikki, and um, it was well, well done. She did a great job, and uh, in just a few moments, Mary Oliver will come and give you the results of our council findings. We, again, are so glad to be in this place to worship a worthy God, so bow with me as we pray. Oh, God, our help in this day and in ages past, we come before you so, so aware that it is a privilege to meet you here. We come with all of our concerns, with all of our cares, but Lord, we also come to praise and to worship. And even as we know that you're here with us, we want you to be pleased with our efforts to raise our voices and our spirits in praise. And I ask you, Lord, that during this day, as we set aside this wonderful servant of yours, that not only would we receive a blessing, but that we would choose to bless others because we get to take the good news wherever we go. Bless us today, Lord. We thank you. We praise you in the high and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Leave it to my daughter to put the wrong thing on the paper. Morning. How are y'all? I just want to say one thing. You do know you're ordaining my daughter, okay? Because, you know, in the wedding service, it says best for the, you know, worst or best. Best is back there. The worst is up here. So half of it, you know, you're dealing with, you're ordaining my daughter. Just remember that, okay? I warned you, Okay. Would you please stand as we do our call to worship this morning? I believe it's on the, no, it's, yeah, it is. There it is. It will be on the board up here for you to read. So read along as I, as, as read yours is all, and I'm as the one. The powerful and power, <clears throat> excuse me, the powerful and powerless. God calls us into the work of love. Within the dissonance and the harmony, God calls us into the song of love. As the word become, became flesh and lived among us, God calls us into the story of love. May the love be the relentless pursuit of this beloved community as all people embark on a new journey together. And all the people said, Amen. you may be seated. Good 
Good morning. If you would turn your hymnals to page 295, what a great song to start off our year and this wonderful service. I don't know about you, but wasn't it refreshing? We drove in in the rain, but we saw that beautiful new landscaping and come into this wonderful new sanctuary, sanctuary to celebrate the Lord. Would you go ahead and stand again and let's lift our voices in praise. Revive us again. singing, you may be seated. It's so good to see everyone and to be a part of this wonderful worship service and the opportunity to be part of this special occasion. Yesterday, it was a pleasure and a joy to be able to meet with the other members of the Ordination Council via Zoom. And um, I'm just going to list the names of the members who were present. Patsy Boozer, Dixie Ford, Rhonda Duncan, Sharonda Duncan. Uh, Mike and I were there, and along with Chris Thomas and Mark Wilbanks. Um, we began with prayer, and then Nikki was asked to share about her faith journey. And she spoke lovingly about how her family and her church family had modeled Christ for her. Nikki also talked about how her experiences throughout her ministry and already uh, the, the ministry that she's doing now had informed and impacted her ministry. And um, so she spoke, she also talked about how um, that she sees the church as this community, as this big um, opportunity for us to live as Christ lived. And she spoke about how um, that she sees the gospel as um, an active thing, not just something on a page or something that we um, talk about. It's something we live. And so she spoke about that with a lot of um, enthusiasm and a lot of honesty, and I appreciated that about her. We asked several different questions about various topics, and we talked about her understanding of the gospel and what led her to, sp to seek her ordination at this particular time. We asked her about her spiritual gifts and how they impact her ministry. And she answered all those questions very satisfactorily. So then we took some time to bless and to affirm Nikki and to acknowledge all that she brings to the gospel ministry. And we affirmed her gifts of encouragement, her welcome of others, her servant heart, her inclusive nature, her care for the least of these among us, her great listening skills, and the joy that she brings to everyone she meets. But mostly, we were very honored and excited to affirm in her her faithfulness to Jesus and her walk with Christ. There were three quotes from the morning that stood out to me, and I wanted to kind of bring those to us. Dixie Ford said, and all of us said yes when she said this, we've all been waiting for this day. And we have. And then Patsy Boozer said, Thank you for always including others in ministry opportunities. Sometimes all we need is an invitation. Isn't that true? And then finally, Mark said, 
We are a part of your story now, and we have been for a while. But this was a unique opportunity, and so I hope that you will look to um, the folks that I listed earlier and know that we're always here. Um, We will continue to pray for you and to support you in your ministry. Well, if you paid attention to the list of names that I've read before, there are a few of us who have some leaky eyes. And occasionally there were some tears of joy that were shed yesterday, but we are so proud of you. You are so loved, and thank you for answering the call of God on your life. We will be praying for you and walking alongside you on your journey as you continue. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Right, everyone with our leaky eyes and everything. Let's go ahead and stand up. (laughs) We're going to sing this beautiful song. Come thou fount of every blessing. What an amazing lyric. It says, I'm prone to wonder, but bind my wondering heart to thee. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart. Yes, I need to move this down. <laughs> we come together as a congregation today to ordain Nikki Haynes. That is, to set her apart as one to whom we, the church, look to equip us to serve God well. Set an example of the life in humility before God and lead us in shared sacrificial service. As we, share, as we start this shared journey... I charge the church family of First Baptist Williams to continue to walk with Nikki on her journey, lending her your support through prayer, friendship, and wise counsel. Help her as she seeks to broaden and deepen the church's ministry to the least of these and the church partners, the church's partnerships with other caregiving organizations. Speak a word on her behalf and open doors for her among all we know. Do all you can to provide opportunities to grow in the knowledge and expertise that she might better serve God. Mourn with her when she mourns. Celebrate with her when she celebrates. And care for her when she needs special care. Be the good family of God in her life. Our scripture call to worship this morning is Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God.
Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick and visited, or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Charge to the candidate. Nikki, as you receive ordination from your church from your church family, we charge you to practice humility all the days of your ministry, so that in word, deed, heart, and thought you reveal the humble Christ to all those around you. Practice good stewardship of your life, your energy and health, mind and body, that you might serve unhindered all the days of your life. Nikki, pursue with diligence multiple avenues of learning that you might maximize the scope and excellence of your service. Practice the fine art of trusting those with whom you work, both clergy and laity, even as Christ trusts you. Practice meaningful forgiveness that you might deal with the inevitable disappointments and hurts of the ministry, yet be unstained. Nikki, practice worship in the company of others and in private, that God might better guide you and sustain you. Encourage and smooth the way for those who come after you, that God's work might more, might more abound. Nikki, minister in such a way that you reveal the model that the redemptive love of God may the Lord let me just start that over. Nikki, minister in a way that you reveal the, the and model the redemptive love of God. May the Lord who called you bless, preserve, and keep you as you minister in the name of Christ all the days of your life. Amen. You remain you may remain seated as we sing him 455 as we put that commitment into song come all Christians be committed
It has been a while since I've been here, and I forgot that the choir comes down, so I thought, "Uh uh-oh, they know I'm preaching, and they're all leaving, (laughs) but I'm I'm glad they didn't leave. Um, This is a beautiful sanctuary. The last time I was here, I was here for a funeral, and Mike Duncan uh, gave me a good tour of the place, as he's out to do, and uh, and it was completely stripped down here. Uh, What a beautiful, beautiful place to worship. Uh, You've done a great job. And this is such a welcoming sanctuary to come. And what beautiful faces when we came in this morning. I will say the first face I did see was Tyler Ponder. But beyond that, (laughs) uh, what a beautiful group you are. And everybody was talking about how Mary had not aged a bit. And then they stopped talking. but didn't say anything else. I want to read a, a verse or two from Luke's Gospel for Nikki. I thought about her on this passage from Luke 22. Uh, Verses 24 through 27. A dispute arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. I'm very grateful that Nikki asked me to be here. Certainly proud and humble to speak on the day that you have said yes to this next step in your Christian journey, to be ordained as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have a hot seat down here for you in a few minutes. This is a beautiful place with beautiful, spirited people that have deeply impacted so many lives through the years, including my own. My sense of calling and my identity as a pastor was deeply shaped by my 16 years here at Williams. And I know you have had an incredible influence as Nikki's church, her church family, in her decision to come today to say, I want to be ordained. But we should remember that she is also a PK, a preacher's kid. And and I I know that Randy sort of jokingly said what he said earlier, but I want to acknowledge the gift of that Christian home that Randy, Cheryl, uh, and Carrie have provided in a positive Christian influence and impact on Nikki's life, and we thank you for that. I'm particularly proud... Uh, of Nikki taking this step because as long as I've known Nikki, this has been a natural part of her personality. To say to God on multiple occasions, here I am, send me. And so this is not a surprise, I think, to any of us that she wants to take this step of ordination to be a minister of the gospel. And I'm very proud that we do it here at Williams. Williams is a church for a long, long time, that has acknowledged and recognized that God does indeed call women to every form of ministry and to be fully members of the ministry of the gospel of Jesus. I'm reminded, as you know, that Jesus, upon his resurrection from the grave, could have chosen anyone to be the first to proclaim this wonderful good news that he lives, he is risen. Jesus himself chose women to be the first to do it. And that phrase, he is risen, he is risen indeed, still echoes. I think you still gather at the cemetery on Easter morning early and say those words. But I have heard those words echoed in the life of Nikki over and over again as her life has demonstrated the reality of the risen Lord among us. I think it was probably when I was in middle school, I was sitting, as you're doing, in a pew somewhere in Hoax Bluff, Alabama, and some preacher that I don't even remember told a story where he imagined soon after Jesus had ascended into heaven after Easter, having a conversation with a group of angels. And the angels say to Jesus, we have observed everything you went through down there on earth. What a mess. And how horribly you were treated, betrayed, abused, crucified. And yet we celebrate your power, the resurrection, and you're here You have done incredible work, Jesus. 
Now, what's the plan now that you're here for earth? And Jesus says, well, I have left some of my followers behind. And these followers come from all walks of life, men and women, mothers and fathers, fishermen, tax collectors, farmers, bread makers and the sort. And I've left them the ministry to renew this world. And the angels consulted among themselves and said, we've been paying attention to these people. And are you sure they can do the job? I'm not sure. So, Jesus, what is plan B if the people fail to do it? And Jesus said, there is no plan B. This is it. It is something about the ministry and the genius of God that God has chosen to work through frail humans like you and me to share the gospel in this world and to renew it in the cause that Jesus came and lived and died for. So in a sense, one of the things we must recognize on a day like today is that every one of us is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? We used to have listed in some Baptist church bulletins the list of the clergy, the members of the ministry and pastoral staff, but then there would be a list that said all members ministers. That's true still, isn't it? Every one of us has been given that ministry. It is an amazing thing that God has done that. I remember, as many of you do, after the tornadoes hit nearly a little over 10 years ago now in our area, there was no one person who shouldered the load. It was a team effort of recovery and work of blessing people and helping people. A team of ministers gathered day in and day out and made tremendous impact on the lives of people who had lost everything. And so we continue it to this day, each one of us taking the call of being a minister in our lives. We do that hard work in the mess of this world with lives that are not perfect, including our own, right? We do it by listening to people even when we disagree with them. We bring casseroles, particularly in times of grief. We attend worship so that our souls are fed and that we feel more equipped to serve. We pray on behalf of those who come across our paths. We show up at other kids' ball games because we believe they're part of us and because we belong to church. I've always thought that was a better way to say it. If somebody said, where do you go to church? That's one thing. And we go to a beautiful place. And we are the church wherever we go. But I've always liked that old-fashioned way of saying, I belong to church. I belong to First Baptist Church of William. I belong there. And the people belong to me, and I belong to them. No matter what I go through in this life and what we face, we belong to each other. And so that means from time to time we will say to God, not my will, but since I belong to this family, your will be done. From time to time we will pray for those uh, who are very different from us and with whom we disagree. I remember that there's only one time, I think this is right, and you check me, where in the Bible, worship of God comes second. That only time is when Jesus says, if there's something you have or someone against you has something against you, a brother and sister, go make that right and reconcile and then come to the altar to worship. And so Jesus says, I have given you the ministry of reconciliation in this world. So all of us are ministers, right? But today, in a sense, we recognize that there are particular people from time to time that feel a special sense of call. And we say, as was so well said in the charge that we heard earlier, we will set you apart. And Nikki, we come to do that today. We set you apart as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is an amazing God we have who has a way of commandeering ordinary people like me, like Nikki, like you, and giving us an extraordinary task in this world. You may follow the news, and and I think a few weeks ago you may have seen where they discovered a wreck of an old crusader ship near Caesarea by the sea in, in Israel. And in the wreck they found some relics from that early Christian period, and one of the things they found, I think it was from 300 A.D. or something, was a ring a Christian must have owned And on the symbol of the ring was a shepherd carrying a little lamb. It's interesting, isn't it? The good shepherd. That was one of the earliest Christian symbols 
of our understanding of who Jesus is, a shepherd. In fact, today, when we call someone a pastor, that word actually means shepherd. That's where it comes from. I remember standing down front here after, I think, my 10-year anniversary, and Doug Ponder, who was chair of the search committee that brought me here, was doing a blessing for me and saying a few words, and he said something that I had never heard before, never thought about before. He said, we're glad to have Mike as our under-shepherd here. And I, I trembled, and I still do when I think about those words that Doug spoke that day. And it struck me that that was, that was my identity, an under-shepherd. That had a profound impact on me, and it still does. And Nikki, I hope that you'll hear whatever people have written on those cards and will say to you today and the days ahead that we bless you as an under-shepherd, following the good shepherd in the work of this world. But I hope you know what you're getting into. I don't think I did. I don't think I still do. It is hard work to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And maybe in our day and time, it is harder than it has ever been. I think one of the great challenges that Christian churches in America face is can we create what some people call a big tent church where truly anyone who wants to hear the gospel, and I've always felt that the best and clearest proclamation of the gospel occurs in a local church. That anyone that wanted to come could come and freely hear that gospel so that the work of salvation with fear and trembling could happen for them. But creating a big tent church with people who are so diverse and a culture so divides us is a different, difficult job. So we tend to tent with our own people, not with people like them. And it is hard to have a church where everybody feels welcome because of that. It's hard work. I think it's still the work God's called us to do but it is hard work. I remember that our work is called to be incarnational. The Gospel of John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so that means we will have to work with messy human beings who are not perfect by any means. Bob Ford, I know many of you know, used to have a little saying, longtime campus minister at Jacksonville State. He said, campus ministry would be great if it weren't for the students. And church life would be easy if it weren't for the people, right? <laughs> Jesus one time said, you faithless and corrupt people, this is Jesus speaking, I'm quoting, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? And part of what we must put up with as we minister incarnationally among messy, lifed people like you and me is are two great diseases, apathy, about the church and about Jesus. You take it or leave it. And overzealousness about Jesus. Annie Lamont years ago wrote that if you come to worship, you need to know that the spirit of the living God may touch your life. You didn't know it walking in the doors. But the spirit of the living God may do something in you that lights you afire. She said her advice for everybody coming to church is to put on a crash helmet because it could be very dangerous for you to come to church and encounter the living God. And if that's true for the average church attender, what must a minister need? <laughs> Often it's been said that ministers only work on Sundays. But that's not true. In fact, one of the things that ministers have learned to do is to park their truck at the church during the week so people think at least they're in there working. But it's not true. In fact, what you say yes to today is something that will never leave you. You will not sleep some nights because of it. You will encounter the very depths of the human experience. The good, the bad, and the ugly, and hopefully the holy. And it will not leave you. You cannot shut it off. There is no way really to do it. We should take care of ourselves, and I hope you will do that. But you cannot shut that out, just as Jesus did not shut it out. And it is a scary thing to work with people who don't know what to do, like we don't know what to do, and we make our way through this life as fellow strugglers. I remember Louis Armstrong, that great jazz musician, 
He grew up in Louisiana, and he said one day his mama asked him to go get a pail of water from a little pond near their house, and he went down there, and there was an alligator in the pond. So he dropped the pail, and he ran back, and his mama said, Louie, where's that pail of water? She said, Mama, there's an alligator in that pond. I dropped that pail. He said, Louie, you go back and get that pail of water. Don't you know that alligator's as scared of you as you are of it? And Louie said, if that alligator's as scared of me as I am of it, that water ain't fit for drinking anyway. It is a scary thing to be a minister, and I'm proud that you have said yes. You will tremble through it. You will agonize over it. It will be hard work with apathetic and overzealous people, and you will encounter all of this stuff, and you will treasure it in your heart as Mary did, and you will agonize over it as Jesus did in the garden. But God has called you, and I'm proud that you said yes to it. So I want to give you just two quick sort of tips that I think might be helpful. Remember that your calling is to be faithful to Jesus. That's your calling. It's not to succeed. It's not to succeed. How much money was given, how many people attended, how many showed up. People applaud me and recognize my giftedness. That's not it. It's to be faithful to Jesus. That old hymn says, trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Eugene Peterson called this long obedience in the same direction, and it will be a long trudging walk for you, I think, just to be faithful. And faithfulness means to listen to God, to listen to God for those promptings that you wish were more clear, like a burning bush or something in the sky, but to listen to the still small voice that will lead your life, I promise you. And listen to the people that you speak with and counsel and pastor and love and listen between the lines to what is really happening in their hearts for often they don't know the words to say what's going on. And sit with your own emotions and allow those things to be listened to. Fred Craddock once said, you should never measure your ministry by taking your pulse. I think he meant that sometimes things will be going so well, your heart will be racing and you'll be so excited and you'll say, well, that's how this is. But there'll be other days when nothing's happening and you'll feel no heartbeat at all and you'll think it's all dead and neither is true, really. David Wolpe, a rabbi that I really like a lot, said there'll be days when you feel like absolutely nothing I've done is working. And he quoted an old 12th century Spanish poet Abraham Ibn Ezra, who said, If I made shrouds, no one would ever die. And if I made lamps, the sun would choose to shine all night long. Nothing I do will matter. And you will feel that from time to time, maybe a lot of time. But keep at it. Long obedience in the same direction. God has called us to be faithful. And over time, maybe you will say, I was there when the seed was planted. I was there when it was watered, or I was there when the harvest was reaped. Either way, God sees. So that's my first tip. And my second one comes from Star Wars, Episode 4, the original first Star Wars that came out. And this is a spoiler alert, but by now, if you haven't known the story of Star Wars, we need to have a consultation. You may remember there's a Death Star that needs to be blown up in that movie. And eventually Luke Skywalker will be the one to drop this tiny bomb down in a pipe that blows up the Death Star. But just before Luke is successful in doing it, there are others who try. And one of them flies down in the canyon of the Death Star, and there's all this shooting going on and turbulence, and everybody, some people are saying, we got to get out of here. And the guy says, stay on target. Stay on target. You can go back. That's exactly the way he said it. Stay on target. The early church, in their faithfulness, did something that is, I think, sometimes more difficult for us. They remembered to stay on target. They said, we preach Christ and Him crucified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, 
as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Nikki, there is still tremendous power in that old rugged cross. Jesus chose to lie down on that cross for our lives, and when He was lifted up, it has continued to draw people to Him people who sometimes didn't realize how awful their lives are, how bad they really are, and how much they needed the grace that He shed for us on the cross. And they realized that God loves them despite their flaws. And that love causes us to love other people that are often very unlovely, just like us. The words that the church has to speak are many these days. And we must find a way to articulate to our society. The church has something to say about biblical justice. The church has something to say about the pursuit of riches, about priorities, about morality, about national conscience, about spiritual well-being. But above all, be laser-focused with the words that articulate clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Point them. Stay on target to the cross of Jesus and let him draw this whole world and all the world that comes before you to himself. It means a lot of things to be called. Today people will lay hands on you and they will drop little hands in a basket and I know you'll read those words. And those people who do it will not be perfect. They will be imperfect, just like you and I are imperfect. But we are called, all of us, to be ministers in cultivating beloved community in this world. And as you work to lead us as an under-shepherd, know that you're not alone. You have an amazing God who's chosen to walk with you in your life through all that you would face. You have an amazing family, a church family, who will be with you and bless you. And you have friends like the ones on those screens that we saw yesterday. I spent a lot of time with you through the years. And I know I pushed you and I pulled you and tried to encourage you to sit in a chair like this at some point long ago. Mark, thank you for finally getting through. <laughs> being that tipping point. But this is really an extension of Nikki's life. A long story of Nikki Haynes saying to God, Here I am. Send me. You've so often said that. I remember, and some of you do, that when we needed help in our youth ministry years ago, it was Nikki Haynes who raised her hand and stepped in for an interim role that she pretty much stayed with to this very day. A long interim. I hope we'll remember that because today we bless you. Jesus said, what makes a person great? I think it's to be a servant. And Nikki Haynes, that is what you are. You are a servant. Nikki Haynes, you are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Amen. Love you, girl. <laughs> one, one, one last thing I want to say before we go to our Lord in prayer is... Uh, Thought about it all week. And I know all of y'all think the same thing. When I, thought, when I think of Nikki, I think of a child, like Mike was talking about, you. Uh, it cannot be separated. Neither, neither can this. It was asked of Christ, Lord, what should we do? How should we act? What should we do to, to earn eternal life? He always, he always pointed to a child. 
I can't help but think of that for you today. It's what brought you here today. And I've done a little more thinking with this simple mind of mine, I, and I've always wrestled with that. And I thought, what does it really mean? And I thought, it, a child, is the personification of unconditional love that Christ offers us. Nick, you don't have change, baby. A child brought you here. A, chi a child's mind is what we'll leave here with, hopefully. Good Lord be it. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father God, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, this is an ordination service for Nikki Haynes. In a way, it's, a, it's to put the final mark. Lord, we, uh, Lord I, I thank you for her life. I thank you for the children's lives that she, that she has shaped all these many years. Lord, continue to use her. Lord, let it be to help all of us to believe more like a child. To accept unconditional love and offer unconditional love as a child does. Lord, we thank you for Nikki's life. I said this seems like a final remark. It's just the beginning. You know that. You started a long time ago. Lord, give her all the strength she needs. She's got all the love. Lord, thank you for sharing, us, sharing her with this church for all these years and for the years to come. It's in the name of our blessed Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen. I was ordained in 1975, it was a century ago, and while I was being ordained, I learned what it meant to suffer. Um, they made me kneel while everybody came by, and I thought that'd never, never stop. <laughs> but it helped me to, to know that this is about humility, this is about surrender. Um, I'm not going to, Mike's done a wonderful job, so... I want to tell you about why we do this. It's thousands of years old, this laying on of hands. It is an effort to, to bless and to affirm that God's doing something in a person's life. We see it in the New Testament. There are people who were particularly gifted, were asked to, to serve wholeheartedly. Today we set Nikki apart. We have seen her in action. I've only known her a little over a year, but I know her heart. I see it so, so well demonstrated so many times. So this is our way of saying that God has done a good thing in summoning Nikki to yet another challenge in her life. Setting someone apart doesn't mean they're perfect. It just means they're available. And today we get to celebrate that. Now, in a perfect world, we'd make her kneel, and we'd all troop by and lay hands on her. And then we'd have to help her get up. But we live in a time when things like that are not possible. So this is what we're going to do. We've already mentioned to you the little handprints. I hope that you will take one or more and put down your thoughts and whatever you choose to bless Nikki. We've also asked some folks to come and stand around Nikki and represent all of us in a time of prayer. And Nikki, I'd like to invite you to come and take your seat here. 
And then those who've been asked to represent us all, would you please come as well? And what I'd like you to do is just surround her, a hand on her arm, her shoulder. And we're going to pray for her. And we're going to all pray for her. Their touch represents our touch. So I invite you to bow, and in a few moments of silence, we're going to pray for Nikki. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, these are sacred moments. What transacts here is something that has eternal significance. This is not a person who has just begun to serve. This is a person who has continued to serve. And we just want to affirm her. How grateful we are that we could spend these moments together on a day like this. And I'm particularly thankful for her family, for her church family, for her school family, for all of those who are blessed by her personality, by her gifts, and most of all, her love for you. So Lord, honor this affirmation. And continue to bless her, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Nikki, would you join me up here?
if you didn't get it, um, Mary wanted you to know that it was unanimous yesterday. Whew. But we're so proud of you. And I want to give you something. It's about time you had a Bible. So, th- no, this is a memento of today, and it is your ordination Bible. It's something that when you pick it up and read it, you'll, re- you'll think of this day and all of these amazing people who were part of it. So we want you to have this. And this is still in process before we want some others to sign. But here is your certificate of ordination. We'll frame it so that uh, you can put it on the hood of your car, whatever you want to do with it. (laughs) But we want you to know that this just represents a little bit of how we feel about you. We love you, and we're so proud of you. As a close of the service today, you'll be here at the front. And I know we've just talked about safety and health, but she's wearing her mask, and if you want to come by and say your greetings to her. And I want to also encourage you to be here Wednesday night. Uh, We're going to honor her on Wednesday night and um, would love for you to join us in that. So thank you so much. And we'll continue in our service. Linnell, come and lead us. Would you stand and turn to him, 462? Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. If you have not already done so, there are baskets here at the front for you to put your your handprints in. If you want others, there are a few left. If you didn't get it all written um, like uh, you want it, give her another one. I've been asked to remind the choir that you'll be rehearsing at 1 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you again for being in worship. And this final word that my father spoke to me at my ordination, I speak to you now. Remember that the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot keep you. Let's pray. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May he make his face to shine upon us. May he guide us to truth, truth that we can live, that we can share with the world the love we've experienced. In his precious name we pray. Amen. God bless.